Meditate first upon this free and endowed precious human existence, so difficult to obtain and so easily destroyed. From this moment on, make it meaningful. Second, everything is impermanent, environments and their inhabitants, the life force of beings in particular is fragile as a bubble. The hour of death is uncertain, and when it arrives, we become nothing but corpses. Because the Dharma is the only help at that time, practice with diligence. Third, at the time of death, there is no freedom due to our former actions, karma. Therefore, abandon harmful deeds and devote the time always to virtuous action. Contemplating in this way, examine the mind stream daily. Fourth, among the places, friends, happiness, wealth, and so on, in cyclic existence, there is constant torment from the three types of suffering. It is like the feast presented by the executioner as he leads one to the execution ground, having cut the shackles of attachment, accomplish enlightenment with diligence. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly, I go for refuge until enlightenment is achieved. Through the merit of practicing generosity and so on, may I attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all beings. Sanye cho dang so ki cho nam la chan chu bardu da gi kap su chi da gi jin so ge pe so nam ki dro la pin chir sanye dru par shok sanye cho dong so ki cho nam la chan chu bardu da gi kap su chi Da gi jin so ge pe so nam ki dro la pin shir sang ye dru par shok. May all beings have happiness and the cause of happiness. May they be free of suffering and the cause of suffering. May they be inseparable from the supreme joy that is without suffering. May they abide in the great equanimity that is free from attachment and aversion. Sim chin tam che dewa dan dewe ju dan dempar gyor chi dugnyal dan dugnyal gi ju dan drawar gyor chi dugnyal mepe dewa dampa dan min drawar gyor chi nirin chak dan i dan drawe tanyon chempo la nepar gyor chi Sim chen tam che dewa dan dewe ju dan Dempar gyur chi. Dugnyal dang dugnyal gi du dang drawar gyur chi. Dugnyal mepe dewa dampa dang min drawar gyur chi. Nirin shak dang ni dang drawe tang yon chempo la nipar gyur chi. And let me uh, find my little striker here. And here is meditation.
Can't hear you, Skip. Can't hear you. Cindy, I was fighting with you to uh, unmute you so we could check and see if your sound is good. There you are. There I am, sorry. Okay, uh, so we're going to take turns uh, having our mics on mute and uh, reading from Moonbeams of Mahamudra. Uh, I believe we're on page 36, is that right, Cindy? Yeah, okay, so we're on page 36 at the tie at the top and uh cindy do you want to take it from there okay um meditation objects okay this chapter is common tranquility meditation meditation objects to attempt at the beginning we can see that there are many types of meditative techniques for settling the mind in tranquility meditation. It is important for people who are given to discursive thinking to begin by meditating on the breath. When such people introduce an object of visualization, they should rely on a single object so as not to further disturb their minds. The Bodhi Prata Pradita says, settle the mind peacefully on a chosen object. Noble Arya Shura says, you will achieve mental stability by concentrating on your chosen mental image exclusively. Do not try to focus on multiple mental images or they will disturb your mind. The initial meditation on tranquility has two aspects. Master Bodhi Bhadra says, there is introspective contemplation and outward contemplation. Introspection refers to visualizing your body as the deity, as a deity, a skeleton, or a sacred trident. It can also include contemplating the breath, an imaginary seed syllable, a mental sphere, light, or even joy and happiness. Some people say we should not use sticks and pebbles as object of meditation, but that is of no real concern. Using an object of meditation, such as a Buddha statue, seems to have many benefits. In any of these options, we use mindfulness to make sure the mind does not wander so that we can learn to hold that concentration and we use that awareness to detect whether we have become distracted and lost our mindfulness. The Sama Dirajas Sutra says, the Buddha has a perfect form, which was golden in color. Anyone who meditates on this image will achieve samadhi. The third Bhava, Bhavana Krama says, anyone who is trying to attain tranquility meditation should imagine a statue of the Buddha and picture it exactly the way they have seen it or heard about it. If you successfully concentrate on a mental image in this way, you can attempt any of the visualizations described above. The first Bhava Na Krama says, when you achieve mental stability in meditation, you can focus on the psychophysical constituents, the elements, and so on. Barbara, do you want to go on? Sure. Retaining the visualized image during meditation. Retaining the visualized mental image during our meditation is very important if we hope to attain mental concentration. Through mindfulness, we make sure the mind does not wander. We use awareness to detect whether the mind has become distracted or whether it has lost its mindfulness. The commentary on the Sutra Lankara says, Mindfulness helps to maintain the object of concentration, while awareness helps to recognize when we have become distracted and lost mindfulness. A traditional analogy says, the mind is like a mad elephant. 
The object of concentration like a stable pole, mindfulness is like a rope and awareness is like a hook. We must use mindfulness and awareness to tie the elephant of the mind to the pole of concentration. The Madhyama Kardaya says, when the elephant of mind wanders, it should be bound with the rope of mindfulness to the stable pole of the meditation object by consistently applying the hook of awareness. If we make too much effort to concentrate, we will only agitate our minds, and if we try too hard to relax into the meditative state, we will only fall into drowsiness and stupor. We therefore have to maintain a balance between being too uptight and too loose. Master Chandra Gomi says, if we apply ourselves too much, agitation will arise. If we do not apply ourselves enough, depression will set in. It is so hard to maintain a balance. What is the point in stirring up the mind? His Dasama Satava also says, Overexertion will arouse mental agitation while non-exertion will bring about depression, but the middle ground is hard to achieve. What is the point in getting agitated? Sorry, I lost track. Where, where are we now? We're at the... We're on 38 Methods for Realizing Tranquility. And Sharon has just joined us. Right. Okay. So um, let, let's just mention that uh, the book we're working with is uh, Moonbeams of Mahamudra. Uh, and it's published by Shogam, S-H-O-G-A-M Publications. And... Um, its subtitle is the classic meditation Ma manual of Trelig Gabgo. So, um, Cindy Alper, do you want to take up the next? Hold on. I've got you. Let me unmute. Let me get it. I've got it. Okay. Now can you hear me? Okay. Thank you. Methods for Realizing Tranquility. This has four sections. The eight antidotes, the nine stages of tranquility, the six powers, and the four mental attitudes. The eight antidotes. This covers the same subject matter as the section on obstacles and antidotes. The obstacles are laziness, forgetfulness, dullness, agitation, not making enough effort, and making too much effort. The antidotes are mindfulness and awareness because they help us recognize dullness and agitation arising. When they do arise, we remove them through the methods explained above. When we begin meditation, we take no delight in it and find pleasure in things that are distracting. We delight in three types of laziness, plain laziness, idleness, and indifference. The first stage of tranquility meditation is known as the stage of application because we have to inject enormous effort into our meditation practice and we must continu continually train ourselves to dwell on the benefits of meditation. As a result, we develop three types of confidence. Undiluted confidence, the confidence of certainty and inconvertible confidence. We must also reorient our way of thinking so that meditation becomes an important part of our lives. We have to continuously dwell on the defects and shortcomings of frittering away our time through laziness, idleness, and indifference. Recognizing the harm and wasting time has to become a spur for our practice. Everyone experiences physical and mental hardships when they meditate, so we should have courage in the face of difficulties. We should take, we should take them on ourselves instead of regarding them as insurmountable obstacles that overwhelm us. The second stage of tranquility meditation is known as the stage of concentration. Because we become aware of distraction when we forget to be mindful and can redirect our attention to the object of meditation, we must also encounter dullness, agitation, and doubts without being aware of them, so we should learn to become aware of those obstacles as well. When we do get distracted by them, we should practice relaxing and tightening our concentration until we eventually learn 
to eradicate those obstacles. When dullness or agitation arises, meditate in such a way that you are not concentrating on anything. Simply remain a state in, in a state of equanimity. These techniques for achieving tranquility are a common practice and can be found in most meditation treatises. Okay. Um, Sharon, do you want to go on? Whoop, 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 whoop. Now you're unmuted. Oh, go, okay, sorry. Go ahead. go ahead. Oh, okay. Am I? Can you hear me now? Yes. The first stage of tranquility is known as resting the mind. It is about trying to control our impressions in an introspective mood, because that will give us the less chance of being distracted. To explain the first stage of tranquility, the Sutra Lamkara says. Rest your mind on the object of meditation and concentrate on it without letting yourself get distracted. We should rest comfortably in the first stage of tranquility and maintain the continuity of that mindfulness until we can settle into the second stage. This second stage is known as continuous resting. The Sutra Lamkara says, we should try to remain in a state of concentration without becoming distracted. The third stage of tranquility meditation is known as patch-like resting. Here the Sutra Lamkara says, if we suffer from forgetfulness, we recognize it and then go back to the object of concentration. In the fourth stage, we should try to gather our agitated thoughts, emotions, and concepts instead of allowing our mind to become scattered. We will then gradually realize we no longer need to control the grosser mental activity. However, there are subtle forms of activity that we should continue to gather in, which is why this fourth stage is called close placement. The Sutra Lamkara says, Skillful meditators always gather the mind more and more inward to increase their concentration. The fifth stage is called pacification because we completely pacify our disturbances through seeing the benefits of attaining meditative concentration. The Sutra Lamkara says, realizing the virtue of samadhi, we train the mind in tranquility. The sixth stage is the state of subjugation because we have now successfully settled all mental activity that gives rise to disturbances in meditation. Having realized the defects of distractions and mental disturbances, the Sutra Lamkara says, realizing the harmful effects of a distracted mind, the meditator eliminates all mental activity. The seventh stage is where we experience through subjugation, which means that from this point, the sub, I'm sorry, the seventh stage is where we experience thorough subjugation, which means that from this point onwards, no mental disturbances arise from desire, dullness, worry, and stupid, stupor. Even if such disturbances begin, we immediately become conscious of them and disperse them on the spot. The central Lamkara says, as soon as we discover, as soon as we real recognize desire, worry, and lust, they dissipate naturally. The eighth stage is called one-pointedness because we are in a state of one-pointed concentration without any mental disturbances and don't need to make an effort to remain in the state of contemplation. Sutra Lamkara says, when we realize stabilization, our effort to concentrate, we achieve, we achieve perfect natural concentration. The ninth stage is the state of complex concentration, which arises from furthering the experience of one-pointed concentration. The Sutra Lamkara says, at this level, we no longer need to make an effort to meditate at all. Great. Okay, I'll take a brief turn here. Um, the six powers. 
we need to develop the following six powers to accomplish these nine stages of tranquility. One, power of hearing. Two, power of contemplation. Three, power of mindfulness. Four, power of awareness. Five, power of effort. And six, power of familiarity. It is through hearing about meditation and concentration that we are able to enter into the idea of practicing meditation. The power of contemplation means that we have heard it, we have heard the power of contemplation, the power of contemplation means that what we have heard is not sufficient in itself to give rise to an understanding of meditation. We have to think about that and contemplate it again and again. If we do this, it will gradually become easier to meditate. The power of mindfulness means that it is only through the practice of mindfulness that we are able to develop concentration and overcome distraction. The power of awareness means that it is only through awareness that we can become conscious of the emotional conflicts that arise in meditation so it is awareness that enables us to overcome them. It is also through awareness that we realize the harmful effects of the obscurations and our mind ceases to hanker after deluded mental processes. The power of effort empowers us to withstand the obstacles of dullness and agitation and to overcome our conceptual proliferation. The power of familiarity means we only become familiar with meditation by practicing it repeatedly. Only then can it start to become a natural process for us. Okay, the four mental attitudes. There are also the four different mental applications to employ in relation to the nine stages of meditation. These are one, concentrated mental application, two, interrupted mental application, three, uninterrupted mental application, and four, spontaneous mental application. We need to apply concentrated mental application during the first two stages of meditative concentration or samadhi and must invest enormous energy in developing our powers of concentration. We can then apply interrupted mental effort to our concentration in measured stages. For example, many obstacles may arise during the fifth stage of meditative concentration, such as dullness and agitation and interrupt the length of our concentration span. We need to learn to interrupt it and reapply it. By the eighth stage of meditation, meditative concentration, we will no longer have interruptions because we will have learned how to cultivate a continuous state of concentrated mind, which is why this is called uninterrupted mental application. On the ninth level of concentration, we may no longer need effort or antidotes because we are spontaneously in a state of concentration. The Shravaka Bhumi says we need to use the four mental attitudes to realize the nine stages of tranquility meditation or no results will be attained. Concentrated mental application has an effect on the first and second stages of tranquility. Interrupted mental application affects the third to seventh stage of tranquility. An uninterrupted mental application is how we realize the eighth stage of tranquility. Spontaneous mental application leads to the attainment of complete meditative concentration on the ninth stage of tranquility. We apply concentrated mental application to the first and second stages of meditation. Interrupted mental application applies to the next five stages. Why is there a difference here? The term concentrated mental application means the mind does not stay in meditative concentration during the first stages. While inter 
intermittent mental application implies that it is still necessary to make an effort when mind is able to rest in meditative concentration. Tranquility meditation needs to be conducted in the way it has been outlined here so that it doesn't become defective. A defective meditation practice will not yield results, even if we were to meditate for a thousand years. The Bodhipatha Pradipta says, if our meditation is defective, no amount of effort will reward our attempts to meditate. Even if we try for a thousand years, no samadhi will arise from that. The Prajna Paramita Sankhya Gatha says, Exert yourself in attaining tranquility through uninterrupted meditation on the innate purity of mind, just as striking flints together sporadically will not cause sparks. Intermediate meditation practice will not lead to tranquility. Do not give up until you have attained samadhi. Okay, um, I'll go on to the next chapter. Common Insight Meditation. The General Meditation on Insight. There are three types of insight. The mundane, one, the mundane level, two, the supra-mundane level, and three, the insight of the Mahayana tradition. The mundane level of insight employs subtle and gross objects of meditation. The supra-mundane level consists of contemplating the Four Noble Truths and realizing the selflessness of ego. The insight of the Mahayana tradition is the approach we will examine here. The Sama Dinira Mokana Sutra says, one, insight using concepts, two, insight establishing the right view of reality, and three, insight born from discriminating awareness. The Samadhi Dinir Mokana Sutra and the Abhidharma Masaikuya mention four types of insight. One, insight arising from analysis because of employing concepts to understand the existence of individual things. Two, Insight arising from determination because of understanding the extent of individual things. Three, insight arising from full comprehension because of using concepts to understand individual things as well as the nature of those things. Four, insight arising from realization because of recognizing the true nature of things after applying the previous methods. The Shravaka Bhumi says, there are six techniques in the practice of insight meditation. These are, one, the identification of existing things. Two, the identification of meaning. Three, the identification of characteristics. Four, the identification of a special occasion. Five, the identification of time and six, the identification of reason. We gain comprehension of the nature of things through insight meditation in these ways. The Sutra Lamkara says, we start by using concepts to develop an understanding of discrimination. Then we allow the mind to relax so that when we can realize that concepts have one flavor, the flavor and of insubstantiality. Master Vajru Bandhu comments, we employ 11 types of investigation in insight meditation. One, using both investigation and examination. Two, using examination without investigation. Three, using neither investigation nor examination. Four, cultivating tranquility alone. Five, cultivating insight alone. Six, cultivating both. Seven, investigating the characteristics of contemplation. Eight, investigating tranquility. 
Nine, investigating the characteristics of equanimity. 10, investigating our own mental cultivation. And 11, investigating with reverence. These are the 11 different types of investigation in insight meditation, and they should be applied in that order. The first three establish the proper view. The following four enhance our meditation. And the last four ascertain the view. In brief, they demonstrate that concepts can be used to understand the nature of reality. As the sutras and treatises on meditation state, when we vigorously rub two sticks together, they will produce flames and be consumed by them. Similarly, if we correctly use analysis to apply concepts to the apprehension of reality, those concepts will produce insight and be consumed by it. This is why it is important to establish a proper view through insight meditation. The insight that dawns will be of a non-conceptual kind. A lot of numbers. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, establishing the view on insight. This has two sections, enumerating the methods of different schools and the relevant method of our system. Enumerating the methods of different schools. The Yogacara school of Asanga and Vasubandhu places great emphasis on the mental aspect of reality by employing the reasoning of non-duality. Whatever the object of analysis, we come to realize its lack of inherent existence by understanding that everything is constructed and fashioned by the mind. We employ the same reasoning to see that even consciousness is empty of inherent existence and that it is insubstantial as the material world. As insubstantial as the material world. The Madhyamaka school of Nagarjuna and Aryadeva puts the emphasis on emptiness. The Svatantrika Madhyamaka propounds the view that both subject and object are devoid of substantiality. They employ the reasoning of the one and the many to get to the root of the existential condition. The Prasangika Madhyamaka uses analysis to establish the ideas of me and mine, subject and object, perceiver and perceived, and the ignorance that gives rise to these divisions is illusory. We will thereby realize everything is insubstantial by nature because it lacks inherent existence. According to this school, the proper view is not to entertain notions of existence or non-existence, emptiness or non-emptiness, because these ideas are just conceptual proliferations. Both schools say we realize a wisdom consciousness devoid of the differentiation of perceiver and perceived through meditation practice. The Prasangika Madhyamaka school is also divided into two further sub-schools. The first advocates self-emptiness because we realize that everything is insubstantial and empty of inherent existence. The second advocates other emptiness because we realize a wisdom consciousness that is independent of any external factors and as a consequence is self-existent. Many Indian and Tibetan masters have said we should first try to realize the emptiness of external phenomena and then to understand that external phenomenon is determined by the mind. We can then turn our attention to the mind itself, and we will realize that the nature of mind is also empty of any inherent existence, and thus devoid of substantiality. Okay, Cindy Alper, do you want to go ahead? Meditation on selflessness why we meditate on selflessness. It is very important to understand what we mean by the notion of ego, what we mean by me and mine and so on. Our primordial ignorance and our failure to examine and analyze things properly means that we automatically conceptualize something called self and selflessness, subject and object, 
me and mind, we best fail to realize the insubstantial, insubstantiality of the self and of, and of, of external objects. Chandra Kirti's commentary to the Katusat Sataka says, the self is conceived as existing by itself without being dependent on anything else. To realize selflessness is therefore to realize the non-existence of the mental implication called self. Selflessness has two aspects, the selflessness of persons and the selflessness of material things. Dharma Kirti says, the notion of self comes from believing that there is something called me that is immutable, unchanging, and permanent. This mistaken notion of a permanent physical body and of a permanent material world gives rise. This mistaken notion of a permanent physical body and of a permanent material world gives rise to the defilements and obscurations. The Mado Sil Bu says, all phenomenal elements that have characteristics are called dharmas. Consciousness is called the person. The self of persons consists of an innate consciousness that regards itself as an enduring, self-existing, substantial entity. It clings to the notion of I, me, and mine and mistakes the psychophysical constituents of skandhas as a permanent entity. The self of phenomenon is created by the mind grasping at external objects as self-sufficient, substantial realities, and clinging to them as unchanging and reliable. These two forms of self engender karma mental obscurations, emotional defilement, and suffering. Sri Dharmakirti says, as long as there is the notion self, the notion of others will arise. If we hang on to these two notions, we experience attachment and aversion. Once we become entangled in attachment and aversion, various mental afflictions start to manifest. The Ratnavali says, as long as we fixate on the skandhas, we will project the notion of self. We continually create fresh karma when this notion of self abides. If this karmic process is perpetuated, we will never put an end to rebirth. It is important to contemplate the idea of selflessness because we will find it impossible to achieve liberation without it. Dharma Kirti says, if we do not purge ourselves of this mistaken notion, there will be no way we can discard the idea of a self. The Katusat Satka, Sataka says, if you realize selflessness in the insubstantiability of an object, all the siege of your samsaric disposition will cease. The Madhya Makavatara says, all our confusions and defilements come from having a wrong notion of the self. When a yogi realizes the notion of the self to be illusory, he is able to eradicate that misconception. By meditating on selflessness, we can reverse the mental processes that fixate on the psychophysical constituents. The locus of the idea of self and other and me and mind. When that reversal takes place, the samsaric dispositions set up by craving, clinging and grasping become nullified and exhausted. We then achieve liberation from samsara. The mula mad madhya Mika Karika says, when the idea of me and mine becomes pacified, the idea of self and selflessness automatically disappear. It also says, when we realize no self within and no substantiality, no substantiality without, we overcome the duality of me and mind. All conditions that perpetuate samsaric existence cease, and karmic dispositions, emotional conflicts, and mental defilements also come to ease, to cease, sorry, to cease. Okay, I think uh, we're short on time here, so let's leave the next section for next week. And uh, I, uh, I'm wondering if Sharon wants to do uh, Medicine Buddha here for us, since your voice was so lovely last week. Me to do skip? Huh? What would you like me to do? That you were doing medicine Buddha last week and it was lovely, so maybe oh. you could do it. Um, do, we all need uh, medicine Buddha right now because of because of coronavirus. So, uh, Sharon, let's uh, keep it to like two minutes, though, okay? 
Okay, we'll just use our little book. Yeah, and you're on page 47, is it? Uh, page uh, 33. Okay, 33. Mm -hmm, 33. 33, Medicine Buddha. Blessed one, whose compassion for all is equal. Uh, can you hear me, everybody? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Blessed one, whose compassion for all is equal. Simply hearing your name dispels the suffering of lower realms. Buddha of medicine, you who heal the sickness of the three poisons, light of lapis lazuli, to you I pay homage. Bhagavan, Tathagata, Arhat, complete and perfect Buddha, glorious conqueror, Buddha of, me of medicine. Sovereign of the light of lapis lazuli, to you I bow, to you I pay homage, to you I offer, and you I take refuge. Te ata om bekanze, bekanze, maha bekanze, raza samud gate soha. Te ata om bekanze, bekanze, maha bekanze. Radha Samud Gate Soha Te Ata Om Bekanse Bekanse Maha Bekanse Radha Samud Gate Soha Te Ata Om Bekanse Bekanse maha bekanse Radha samud gate soha Te ata om bekanse Bekanse ma raza me bekanse Radha samud gate soha Okay, I uh, have the lawn cutters outside my white window so maybe uh, Stephen could do our dedication to this merit may I swiftly yes, accomplish the realization of the Buddhas and their Bodhisattva errors and may I bring each and every single living being to that perfect state as well may Bodhicitta precious and sublime arise where it has not yet come to be and where it has arisen, may it never fail, but grow and flourish ever more and more. By this merit, may all beings attain omniscience and defeat the enemy of wrongdoing. May they be liberated from the ocean of existence, which is shaken by the waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. By the blessings of the Buddhas who have attained the three kayas and the unchanging truth of reality, as well as the unwavering aspirations of the Sangha, May all the aspiration and dedication prayers be fulfilled. Gewa dini dur dak seche yawa drujurne roa chikyang malu ba dei sala gopar shok chang chub sem chok rim po che makye panaki gur chik. Ye pa nyam pa me pa yang go ne grondu kawar sho. So nam di yi tam ched zig pa nye. Tob ne ne pe dranam pa nje ne. Ye gana chi balab trupa yi. Sid pe so le dro wado war sho. 
Sangye kusunya pejin labdam. Chon yi ming yur dem pejin labdam. Gendu mi che dum pejin labki. Jita go wa mon labdru parsho. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll unmute everyone to give it, you all a chance for final comments. <laughs> Bye all, have a good week. Same to you. Just good to see everyone's face. <laughs> yeah, let's all be Great. safe. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Kashi delay. Kashi delay. Kashi delay. Peace, take care now. See you next week. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye.